Okay, so that's it for housekeeping. Let's get on to uh, the sermon. Uh, and hopefully this will just be the last one. Just got a couple of last points I want to cover on this topic of the New Testament, on the topic of eternal security, and just understanding these different passages in light of the New Testament, and in light of eternal security, and in light of salvation by grace. So we'll just jump straight into it and go to my first one. I just want to go to Matthew 10, 23. And this is really a common one used by many Calvinists. Um, because their last point of Calvinism is the P, the perseverance of the saints. And you'll find people, even just yesterday, I spoke to a Pentecostal lady. It was the last door that I knocked on. It was a Pentecostal lady. And, you know, she was saying, oh, yeah, it's all Jesus and everything like that. And this is why, uh, you know, if, if I had stopped at that, you know, you guys really have to be careful, like checking with eternal security when you, when you speak to people at the door. Because when I was speaking to this lady, she was like, yeah, it's not by works, it's all grace, it's all Jesus. But then when I asked her, well, do you think there's any way that you can lose your salvation? She was like, oh yeah, well, you've got to be careful to walk on the path because if you don't take care, you can lose your salvation. So if I had not asked that question, it would have just left at that. So we, we want to make sure when we're out soul winning, you know, check with the terms of security. It's a great check to see whether they truly believe salvation's by grace, only through Jesus, or they believe that they are somehow preserving or keeping their salvation. And this is the verse she actually quoted. She was, you know, going on about like, oh, you know, you got to endure. You got to endure unto the end. And this is what Matthew 10, 23 is talking about here. Um, let's just read for, from uh, 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So Jesus here, and this is what is interesting about this passage, because Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's sending out these disciples to preach the gospel two by two. And it's almost like when you read it, you think, well, he's just saying this to them and what's going to happen to them at that time. But then you, you read verse 23 and it's like, whoa, is, hey, wait a second. Is this passage actually prophetic? of the end times. And he's actually talking about what's going to happen during the tribulation. Because he says here, but when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So, you know, is this a, is this, is this a reference to his second coming? And um, it may be prophetical in the sense that when we are fleeing into the mountains, when we are fleeing during the days of the tribulation, maybe that's what it's going to be like. Like we may not necessarily be just be dwelling in, in the mountains and such in the wilderness. Maybe we're fleeing into the mountains because we're trying to get to the next city and we're fleeing from city into city. Because if you think about it, even a worldwide government can't cover every uh, nook and cranny of their country. It's kind of like in, in China. You know, China has this one world policy. But when you ask Chinese people, oh, you know, isn't it this, this Stalinistic, you know, Mao the type of uh, socialist communist government that's so oppressive, it's going to control and, and, you know, you try and have more than one child and you throw in prison or whatever. But um, one thing my, my brother's wife actually told me is it's really only in the cities where it's, it, there's more persecution because that's where the government is. But when you're living in the country, you know, they're not surveilling every single country and rural city and rural town. So there, there are these rural cities and rural towns where the government doesn't really have their fingers in so much, uh, where people do have multiple children and they're not, you know, persecuted for it or told off for it because the government's not surveilling out there. It's a bit like with homeschooling these days. A lot of people don't register their children to homeschool just because you know, a lot of the homeschoolers know the government doesn't have the resources all the time to go and find these people. That, and there's so little homeschooling parents anyway that they're not really investing the time to go look for them. Um, and it's not like they're a danger to society, like you know, the whole vaccination scare. Like if you don't vaccin vaccinate, then your child is like this walking plague. But um, 
you know, with homeschooling, though, it's like they, they don't really care. So it's, it's even, I remember we went to a conference once and the speaker was even saying, uh, he, you know, because he was saying, oh, you know, just between you and me, just don't even register. Because he's saying, like, if you don't register, they're not going to know. They don't have the resources to find you. They know there's like hundreds of parents out there that aren't registered and um, they don't do anything about it. But who knows whether that's going to change, you know, whether they will, will, you know, try and invest more resources in that. Um, how did I even get onto that? Uh, the son of man become, oh, fleeing. Yeah, that's right, fleeing into the cities. Um, so with that in mind, if we compare scripture with scripture, um, we can say, well, this is not necessarily Jesus talking just to his disciples, but it's actually prophetic about what's gonna happen in the end times. So let's go to passages like Matthew 24 and see what this saved actually means. So let's go here. And if we read in Matthew 24, let's just go down to that passage. And it now talks about this flight. You know, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. So it's saying like when you have little children in those days, it's going to be even harder for you because obviously with children, they're not going to be able to travel as far and walk as far. You're going to have to carry them. You know, let's imagine if you're trying to hide and your baby is, um, is, is starting to cry and things like that. It's just going to make those days a lot more difficult. He says, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And look at this. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So when the Bible uses the word saved, um, it's not necessarily always talking about being born again, being having that spiritual salvation. I won't turn to Mark 30, 13, verse 20, but the same passage there of the, what they call the Olivet Discourse, this preaching that Jesus does on the end times, where he's saying, you know, times are going to get so hard, it's going to be, the, the tribulation and persecution is going to be like it never was before. And unless Jesus actually returns to stop it and cut it short, every person who does not go along with this agenda is going to be put to death. So that's what it means by when you endure to the end shall be saved. It's if you make it through those three and a half years and get to the end of the tribulation, you will be saved because you will see Jesus come in the clouds and your salvation will draw nigh that physical salvation when Jesus actually re returns. Now, another example here, just to show you that this word saved does not always, and even salvation sometimes in the Bible does not always refer to a spiritual salvation, but a physical salvation. Um, but in uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, yeah, you like that book, don't you, Timothy? It's got the same name as you. So 1 uh, Timothy 2, I want to show you here. Um, where was I going? Let's verse... Uh, Yeah, let, uh, let's read from verse 11. It says here, let the, whim, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. So this is the Bible teaching here that when the teaching is going on, women are to learn in silence. They're not meant to you know, say their opinion. Uh, women, when we gather as a, as a church body, should not be preaching the word of God to everybody because they're meant to be learning in silence. So women should not be saying yes Amen. I agree during the preaching because they're meant to learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So it doesn't mean that you... So, so church is not this building. It's not like when you come to this building um, that uh, you, you can't say anything. You can't talk to anyone. You can't sing. It's about the learning in silence. When the, when the preaching is going on, this is when women are to uh, learn in silence with all subjection, and that, that's why they don't teach. But during the singing, you know, sometimes we have women pray. We might have women give a testimony and things like that. Uh, that's fine. You know, it's fine for women to, to sing a special. You know, and obviously you can talk within these premises because that's not church. But when the preaching is going on, the teaching of God's word, that's when women learn in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So we're given the reason why it's like this. Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 
And just because women, I, I believe God knows, is women were geared to be more emotional, to be more led by the, their heart. And this is why they're more easily deceived. You know? And this is why you know, um, you know, women can change their opinions a lot easier than men do, because men are just geared that way to think more analytically, think more soberly. They don't think so much emotionally. But if you're a guy that does think emotionally, you know, people would find that a bit feminine. You know, like guys that are a bit more emotional, guys that, um, you know, are easily swayed and, and don't have this strong, that's a more of a feminine trait than it is for a guy to be a strong leader, to, to make the decisions, to know what and why he believes things. Um, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Look at this. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So <laughs> there's often a long-standing joke just amongst, you know, just people that know the Bible. They say, well, you know, do, do women need to have children in order to be saved <laughs> because of this fact? So you can see here that the word saved doesn't necessarily mean being born again, because otherwise you'd say, well, saved means saved means saved. Um, is that what this verse is talking about? It's saying here, well, if you're a woman, this is how you get saved. Well, what about women that can't have children? What about women that aren't married? Does that mean they, they, they're doomed? They're, they're condemned, right? Because they can't have children and get salvation. Well, no. Um, let's go down to 1 Timothy 5. So we read further on. We'll see here uh, what it means, to this, this saved means. Um, what is she being saved from? And even in 1 Timothy 2, you can already get an idea of what she's being saved from. But um, we'll read it here. Verse 11, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. So it's interesting here that even the natural plan that God has in place for the reason why women are under authority, which is what 1 Timothy 2 was talking about, the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why she is exhorted to have children and be a keeper of the home is because of that, that more uh, easy attribute to be deceived, you know, and, and this is what it's talking about. It's not salvation from hell, it's salvation from deception, being saved from the deception of Satan, being saved from the deception of becoming this tattler and busybody, and this as well is the problem of uh, daughters who are not in a strong family, who are not under a strong father authority figure, what happens? They end up being these busybodies and tattlers going around being a whore or a slut uh, and just sleeping around because they don't have sometimes that uh, strong authority figure in their home to keep them uh, in check and save them from turning aside after Satan. So you can see here that the word save does not always refer to spiritual being born again. It can refer to just being saved from something negative in your life, uh, whether it's being killed, like it's talking about in the end times, in the tribulation, or being saved from this deception and from false doctrine and error and falling into or getting into this sin. Now let's go to another one. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Um, where are we going from? Hebrews 10, 26. Okay, let's read from verse 26. It says here, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, this is often a passage 
which people turn to to show that you can lose your salvation because they'll say here see even if you're saved even if you've received the knowledge of the truth if you sin willfully if you don't turn from your sins and you keep sinning and it's funny that they say things like that it's like the lady that i spoke to yesterday she's like you can't just keep sinning and it's like but we both do that it's a, it's almost like they say that as, as if they forget like they like the bible says if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us because people that just think well yeah if you just keep on sinning you're going to lose your salvation it's like you don't see yourself as sitting in that category as well that you're somebody that keeps on sinning too we all as christians will keep on sinning every day both unwillingly and willingly and even people that tell you that oh you know i but when i sin it's always unwillingly it's just because i can't because i've got this flesh nature but if i wanted to i wouldn't sin liar you know people that say that because there are so many times where people sin willfully as well as un unwillingly as well like that like it, it that, that is just a lie uh, and they've deceived themselves the bible says if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us so <clears throat> who number one if we take this passage this way who even sits in that category because we all sin willfully so are we all now in danger of losing our salvation and going to hell is this what this passage is talking about can it even mean that in light of other scriptures that talk about eternal security eternal life everlasting life shall not kind of in, come into condemnation never perish uh how can it how can we have a passage in here saying that we can lose our salvation when we have clear passages that say it's eternal life we cannot lose our salvation so what is this talking about there's two real views on this passage one is that this is a chastisement of god and you know god chastises us with this certain fearful and looking for a fiery indignation so this fiery indignation is not necessarily the fires of hell it might be the burning sensation you get when you get spanked on the butt you know and um you know things like that so they'll say you know this fiery indignation is just the anger of the lord coming on you and he's angry with you and he's coming to chastise you and uh, that's why you got to fear the lord so that's one way to look at it right and, and i can see the case for it i can see the case that it's like you know saying that we sin willfully and, and paul's including himself there is talking about believers um talks about you've received the knowledge of the truth and later on it says it's a fearful things uh in verse 30 it says the lord shall judge his people now the reason why i don't necessarily think this is talking about believers and god being angry with believers and chastising them i think it's talking about a judgment of unsaved people people that are not saved um, is because if you compare it actually to deuteronomy 32 where this passage comes from uh, and then this is quoting those passages it's hard for me to believe that when i compare it with deuteronomy 32 and the things it says in here that it's referring to a chastisement of saved people as opposed to a judgment of unsaved people and i'll try and explain where i'm coming from so let's just go to deuteronomy 32 and just read that passage so you can see the 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 the, the similarities between this and that uh, deuteronomy 32 and we'll read from 26 26 all right so yeah 26 i said i would scatter them into corners i would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men were it not that i feared the wrath of the enemy lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely and lest they should say our hand is high and the lord hath not done all this for they are a nation void of counsel neither is there any understanding in them oh that they were wise that they understood this that they would consider their latter end how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the lord had shut them up for their rock is not as our rock even our enemies themselves being judges for their vine is the vine of sodom and of, of the fields of gomorrah their grapes are grapes of gall their clusters are bitter their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of ass asps so asps are snakes is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures to me belongeth vengeance and recompense so remember in uh, hebrews 10 it, it was uh, you know vengeance belongeth unto me i will recompense saith the lord to me belongeth vengeance and recompense their foot shall slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand so if you remember the day of calamity um you know is when if you remember in proverbs 1 you know i'll laugh when their cal calamity comes right and the things that shall come upon them make haste and look at this for the lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants 
when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left, and he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. So in the Old Testament, he's talking about the nation of Israel being his people, but he's talking about, about judging his people and sending them into captivity. And you know, even the, there's uh, the, the curse and things like that. So see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. Look at this. I kill and I make alive. So a judgment on God's people is not that he's going to kill them. Like if we're, talk, we're going to apply it spiritually in the New Testament. Um, this killing, you, when you get killed spiritually, is when you go to hell. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So remember he said in Hebrews 10, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So if we compare this with Deuteronomy 32, falling into his hand is saying like nobody's going to protect you from you being killed by God. So if that's the fiery indignation in the New Testament and that's being applied to believers, it's hard for me to accept that that's just a chastisement rather than it actually talking about hell and death. Um, for if I, for I lift up my hand to heaven and say I live forever, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment. So again, judgment, the sword being killed. Um, I will render vengeance to mine enemies. So just take note of that, that this is a punishment that is on the enemies, right? In, in Hebrews 10, we'll go back there in a moment, but you'll see the adversaries, right? The enemies. Um, I, and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh. Does this sound like a chastisement? This doesn't sound like... See, the sword represents death, judgment, and, and execution. It doesn't represent spanking. Like, God doesn't get a sword and then spank you with a sword. The rod is what represents a spanking and chastisement, but the sword represents judgment. So um, he says here, it shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. So again, I'm not saying that I'm basing, you know, what I believe on the Old Testament here, but I'm just saying, like, when you have these two together, it's really hard to think that Hebrews 10 is talking about a chastisement. I think what we're seeing here in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 32 is we're seeing both, right? We're seeing the judgment of God, and we're also seeing him save his people. But when, when you're referring it to the Jews and the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, you know, when they were judged, they were sent into captivity uh, for not turning from their sins uh, and things like that. But he was merciful unto them if they did turn from their sins. So the, the New Testament of that is we turn from our sins by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't, then we are judged and sent to hell. So let's just go back to uh, Hebrews 10, just with Deuteronomy 32 in mind. Uh, So I'll get to the sinning willfully in a moment, but he says here, but if we, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. So again here, judgment, not chastisement and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. So remember when we read in Deuteronomy 32, that devouring of the adversaries was God killing people and, you know, drunk with the blood and all that sort of stuff. And the fiery indignation, I mean, it's hard for me to accept that that is not hell, right? I mean, w w there's, no, there's no other place in the New Testament where a chastisement of God is, is related to fire. Fire in the New Testament is always usually talking about hell. I, I don't know of an, an example where it isn't, unless you guys can let me know. I'm not thinking about one off the top of my head right now. So certain look, fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So again, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So again, if you went against the law of Moses, you were killed when, for something that uh, was uh, worthy of capital punishment. Again, referring to death, not a chastisement. It was a judgment from a judge to a criminal. And then it says here, of how much sore a punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and accounted the blood of the covenant where wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had, and had done despite unto the spirit of grace. 
For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So the way I understand verse 30 is when it says the Lord shall judge his people, it is just quoting um, Deuteronomy 32 and quoting that passage saying that God would judge his people. He was going to judge Israel. If they did not turn and, or I guess, believe on him, they would still go to hell. So this is how I take this passage because it's hard for me to accept that this is referring to believers when there's so much evidence and scriptural support to think that this is talking about hell. Uh, I don't believe believers can lose their salvation. So what is it talking about? So I think that that is uh, verse 30 is just referring and quoting back to Deuteronomy 32. And because this is a book uh, primarily written to Hebrews, even though we can obviously, you know, when you think about like the book of Romans, it was written to a physical Roman church. And, and you know, you need to take that into account why some things might be said that way. But that doesn't mean that these things we can't learn from and apply to us. So we don't say, well, just because it was written to the Hebrews, therefore nothing of it applies to us. We just need to think, well, it was written to the Hebrews. So maybe that's why Paul can say, if we sin willfully, because he's referring to himself as a Hebrew, as opposed to a believer at this point. Um, so what he might be saying here in Hebrews 10 is he's, you know, exhorting the, the, the Jews and the Hebrews to say, if we sin willfully, if we do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have no other hope. We're just looking for this fiery indignation that's going to devour the adversaries. And then he goes on and then quotes Deuteronomy 32, the Lord shall judge his people because, hey, just because we're Jews, that doesn't mean we're going to escape the judgment of God just because we're Jews. We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And this is why when it comes to verse 26, when it says we sin willfully, you kind of got to think, well, what is that, what is that sin that is being willfully done? You know, is it just, just sin in general, just like not loving somebody and just breaking the commandments? Or is it referring to a specific sin and saying, if you willfully do this sin, you have no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Now, I personally think that the sin that is being committed, that people need, that these Jews need to be aware of is rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, rejecting the salvation that is offered to them and the grace and the mercy that is offered to them in the New Testament. Because it, it says here in verse 29 what they're actually doing. Because it's saying you sin willfully, you don't have any more punishment for sin. It says here in verse 29, you know, he says, he goes on about like Moses dying under two or three witnesses. And then verse 29, he says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye, so this is what they're doing, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So the way I take this, this is somebody that is rejecting the Son of God. They're rejecting the Son of God, they're, they're rejecting the blood, and they're rejecting the Spirit of grace. So they're I take this as they are rejecting salvation. Um, now, if I compare this to um, this, these other passages, let me just show you here. Um, 1 John 5, verse 6. I want you to notice the similarity here between, you know, they rejected Jesus, they rejected the blood, remember the blood of the covenant, and then the spirit of grace with uh, 1 John 5, it says here, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood. So there's the blood. Even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So remember, Jesus came by water and blood, and then you have the spirit. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 
So I think there's a connection here between somebody rejecting the Son of God, the blood of the covenant, and the Spirit of grace with 1 John 5 saying, hey, we have to receive this witness that comes from the water and the blood and the Spirit. These three agree in one, the, the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And, and this witness we must receive. And if we don't, we don't have life. Um, now let's just go again as well to Acts. I'm going to show you this passage here, Acts 3. Verse 25. So these are my thoughts on this passage in Hebrews 10. Look at this, because you know it says like if you sin willfully. Uh, it's interesting that um, uh, I want to show you this passage here in Acts 3. But I believe that when a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they have turned from their sins in a sense because they have that imputed righteousness their sin is not imputed to them and this is how i believe we understand this acts 3 and this is why you know paul i think even writing to the hebrews can say to them you know if you sin willfully if you don't turn from your sins and believe on the lord jesus christ not turning from your sins in the sense stop sinning but turn spiritually from those sins by believing on the lord jesus christ believing on the lord jesus christ will turn you from sins because you'll have this imputed righteousness look at what it says here in acts 3 here it says here ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which god made with our fathers saying unto abraham and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you first so remember the gospel was preached to the jews first unto you first god having raised up his son jesus sent him to bless you so there's the blessing of abraham in turning away every one of you from his iniquities so a lot of people will use this passage to say oh here you see this is why you have to turn from your sins but i think in the right context why well, we read ezekiel 3 just before um, we uh, went into the preaching today i remember it was talking about hey the wicked turn from his way so that was the old covenant physically turning in your flesh from your sins the new covenant is if you believe on the lord jesus christ this spiritually turns you away from your sins which is required in order to be saved and we get that imputed righteousness as we covered in the last couple of sermons in romans 4 you know he imputeth righteousness without works and even in romans 10 we'll go there um let's go here Romans 10. See, look, for they being ignorant, or even, even here referring to Israel, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay, for Christ is is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth so you see when we believe on the lord jesus christ we get that imputed righteousness it turns us away from our sins and and this is what i believe hebrews 10 is referring to when it says if we sin willfully because if we just continue in our sins we don't believe on the lord jesus christ which turns us from our sins then there is no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful of looking for a fiery uh, indignation and judgment which shall devour the adversaries and then comparing that to deuteronomy 32 even though he's quoting the lord shall judge his people if we go to deuteronomy 32 it is about judgment it is about those that do not turn they will be judged and slain uh, rather than finding mercy uh, by turning from their sins um okay i'll leave it at that because I, I don't want to start the next part and not finish it but next week i'll go into um the unforgivable sins uh you know in ways you be, can become reprobate uh, and just how that ties in with um eternal security because a lot of people say well if i'm eternally secure like what if i commit these sins i'll talk about that next week all right let's pray and then we'll sing another song Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, uh, Lord, I, I, I pray that you give us wisdom to just understand some of these hard passages. I know that there can be different interpretations, Lord, but I pray that no matter what interpretation we accept when it comes to these uh, harder passages, I pray, Lord, that we would do the diligent study. We would um, uh, compare scripture with scripture. And Lord, we would believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to us um, so that we 
when we uh, try and decipher these passages, Lord, that we would pray for wisdom, pray the Holy Spirit would guide us, and Lord, we would not um, misunderstand passages because we're not understanding them in light of other scriptures and in light of the New Testament. We thank you, Lord, that we have eternal life. We thank you for Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the work that was done this weekend. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to move forward and uh, grow, Lord, and help us not to become lazy. And um, we thank you, Lord, uh, for how you use sinners like us. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.